it had been 50 years, but when you look at that exhibit, you got a very stiff kick in the stomach. I always felt terrible about what we did to the Vietnamese people. We had the luxury of going to war in other people's countries. And uh, certainly our, our soldiers uh, had a really tough time there, but they didn't have to live there. They could come home. But the Vietnamese, for, for the 10 years of the war, had to live in these war zones. After coming back and you look and you see, the, all, all the other circumstances in which soldiers fought in various units and different battles and whatnot, you can see that the ones who had to make the determination, VC friendly, friend or foe, they had no basis to make that decision. And that's, and things like me lie result from that. You know, it's, it's a horrific circumstance. What basically happened in Milai is that soldiers who were told to kill anything that moved um, were landed in what's called Sun Mai Village by the Vietnamese, but in our maps it was called Milai 3 or Milai 4. And about 100 soldiers in about a four hour period between breakfast and lunch killed, murdered really, 504 civilians, mostly men, women, and children old men, women, and children. They were just methodical, and they didn't just kill, but they raped women, they uh, mutilated their bodies, and the army managed to cover up that atrocity for 18 months. The captain who was involved with the company, Medina, ordered that slaughter to take place, and yet he was not uh, punished in any way for that. I always felt fortunate. My company never had a situation like that. I would say it's, it's important for me to be involved in any way I can to, to help educate people on the realities of, of, of putting people in that kind of combat situation. You know, I came of age during the Vietnam War. I was graduating from college in the, um, in the mid 60s. And I knew what was next was being drafted. I just felt like I couldn't go. I couldn't go and, and fight in this war against these people. I, uh, I called myself a draft dodger, because that's basically what I was doing. Since I started um, hanging out with the guys at Veterans for Peace, they say, no, no, you were a war resistor. And um, the first response when I tell a, a veteran, when I meet them for the first time, a Veterans for Peace, that I, I wouldn't go, I, I decided not to go, they say, oh, good for you. And they tell me their story. I was just getting out of high school. I didn't know any better. I was in college locally here at Plattsburgh, and I, I wasn't, didn't feel like I was going anywhere. I wasn't interested. So I didn't pay any attention and just had fun. Well, of course, I got booted out after a couple of years. I had applied to Vista, but what I didn't count on was the university letting the draft board know that I was out in May instead of September. <laughs> I got accepted to Vista in the morning, a telegram, the afternoon mail brought my draft notice. And the draft notice superseded the uh, Vista. So that was that, you know, but so you, know, you feel you, you owe your country something, of course. I was drawn to Veterans for Peace. Even though I'm not a veteran, I, I'm an associate member of Chicago Veterans for Peace because I really respect so much veterans who come back from, from the military and say there's got to be a better way. We want to work for peace. Uh, we want to fight militarization. Um, so that was, they were a great group for me to be, to be part of. This, the, the, this whole idea of, um, I don't know, support, supporting war to support the troops is, is wrong-headed. Okay, I grant it, you've got to support the troops and take care of the troops, but one of the best ways to do that is to not send them into circumstances in which they have no chance of, of succeeding. And we didn't in Vietnam. Most people, I would say, tend to view what's going on in the world um, through a lens of good guy, bad guy, okay? And they're the bad guys over there, wherever they are, so whatever happens to them doesn't matter. But those bad guys love their families, work every day. Which is what this exhibit is about, is it really exposes the true costs to the people who are trying to live in these countries with their families, 
when we go to war in those countries. Most uh, people looking at it realistically say at least two million civilians were killed. Why so many civilians? They all weren't massacred in villages like Milai. A big number were probably lost with bombs. And we're just replicating that same model in Afghanistan, in, in Iraq, we replicated it. And we're replicating it around the world now with our drone policies. We have a couple of uh, Vietnamese garments that were captured in a raid on a tunnel. And they stuffed some grenade fragments. A young Vietnamese woman, she was feeling the, the fabric and she was looking at it and she sat down with me. And, and I said, how are you doing? And she said, I miss my grandma. She had to leave the country when she was four years old. Her grandma taught her to sew. And in those garments, she could see the exact way her grandma stitched. Another woman, she said, you know, I support the administration and I support what they're doing. And I think sometimes we have to go to war. And then she teared up and she said, boy, but this is hard. It's hard to see this. And it's made me sort of rethink and see this from another side too. So there's there are sort of two examples of uh, people who've been, who are being moved. Veterans Coming Home is made possible with support from Casella Resource Solutions and the CloudSplitter Foundation.